Good after folks. Good out good after folks. <laughs> good afternoon. Folks, welcome to the John Morgan Show. See you soon. I'm Kurt Dillinger, the president of Life International, and we have had a delightful evening with John, and uh, his whole presentation is uplifting and life-giving and strengthening for all of us, and it gives us hope for the future, for our country, more than that, for our faith, our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This has been absolutely perfect for us at Life International, and we highly recommend this man to join you for your evening or your event, wherever that might be. God bless you. Simple story, the passion and the glory. Just trying to make it through the day. You know we're trying to come together. Arm in arm and hand in hand. And with my brother, I will fight to unify our land. America, home of the brave. We stand strong. When we're willing to change And I will wash the feet of freedom And bow down on my knees Praying for a healing Fighting for the freedom Of my brother and me And on the other hand There are those who would undo us Unruly who would rule us and break us all apart And I will stand beside you And fight against injustice And lawless ones among us Come on, let freedom ring America, America Home of the brave We stand strong your guitars and tune them melody and harmony let's make a little revelry he purpose to know get your guitars and tune them melody and harmony let's make a little revelry he purpose to know get your guitars and tune them melody and harmony Let's make a little revelry.
Greetings, folks. Welcome to the John Morgan Show. I am your host, John Morgan, and I am absolutely honored to be with you today to talk a little bit about something I just learned this morning. Pretty crazy. You know, in, the, in, the, in our walk, we hear stuff, but we got to rehear it. We got to keep hearing it. Hey, Jim. Good to see you. Good to see you. Went the wrong way. You know, you'd think I'd learn left from right. If I hit this button, see, it goes backwards. If I hit this button. <laughs> it's just left arrow, right arrow. It's really simple. It might seem complicated, but it's, but it's, a lot of it's really easy. But I've, I've, uh, I know this is my left hand because this is my ring finger. And this is my right hand because it's not my ring finger. I learned that back when I used to only wear one ring. <laughs> now I wear two rings, but it doesn't matter because I remember this is my actual wedding ring. And this is the diamond ring that, Kat, that I, I actually found this in a box of Cracker Jacks. Yep, that's true. True, genuine diamonds. Kathy told me one year that if I didn't behave, all I was going to get for my birthday was a box of Cracker Jacks. And uh, so this is my first birthday after Kathy and I got married. And so she steamed open a box of Cracker Jacks and steamed open the little prize and inserted this diamond ring and, and then put it all back in the Cracker Jack box and sealed it closed and Gave me a box of Cracker Jacks for my birthday, and it was all I got. <laughs> and when I got it open, oh, what a surprise. A ring was revealed, and uh, first she pretended like it was, you know, wow, somebody at the factory, you know, but, you know. And, uh, and I was very, very, very happy that she had gotten me a, a beautiful diamond ring. But I'm too sentimental. I couldn't take off my actual wedding ring that wouldn't fit on my finger because I was swollen up from nervousness on the day of my wedding. And so I wear them both. And uh, if anybody asks why, I just, I just, <laughs> I tell them one is to signify my wedding, my marriage to Kathy, and the other one is to signify my membership in the Bride of Christ. Hallelujah! But actually, they're, they're both wonderful gifts from my beloved wife, Kathy. Hey, Beth! Good to see you. Welcome to the John Morgan Show this afternoon. I'm glad you're there. So, I've been perplexed recently as I have pondered, um, you know, uh, faith and and posturing, posturing. How, you know, how do you do? How do you deal with? Unbelief. How do you deal with the doubts that you have in your own heart and in your own mind um, as you go through your life? You know, because the Bible says one thing clearly, and sometimes experience doesn't seem to bear it out. And yet, and and for most Christians, uh, you know, they, they give up. They, they just live a nominal life. They, they don't live that adventurous, on-the-edge uh, life of faith that I want to live. And uh, I remember the day, and I've probably shared it on this program. It's in my book, War on Fear, and it was the genesis, really, of the book, War on Fear, when I was sitting in church lamenting over the fact that I don't live a cutting-edge, faith-filled, New Testament, book of Acts, kind of life, and I, right in the middle of, on Christ the solid rock I stand, I was asking God, why not? And he spoke so clearly to me the answer in one word, unbelief. And my immediate response was, right out loud in the middle of the song, I declare war on unbelief, and I meant it. 
and I, I felt the atmosphere in my immediate vicinity change as I felt God get excited about somebody willing to go to the mat, to go to war with his enemy and mine, unbelief, because the word of God is very clear. God wants us to be trusting in him. He wants us to be believers of his word. In fact, (laughs) the word of God says, without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. My bride. Hi, Kathy. I love you, sweetheart. Impossible to please him. So I have a friend who has been umpteen times to uh, Ethiopia and many other countries and has uh, held vast crusades and seen thousands of people dramatically healed, delivered, set free, uh, demons cast out, all kinds of, of things like that. And um, for me, I've had a smattering of those things, uh, enough to write a book and tell a cool story. But I want, I, want, I want today's version of that. I want that every day. I want every day in my life to be an adventure with God living in the supernatural. I like, I like um, the television host, Sid Roth, whose show is called It's Supernatural. And he says where it's naturally natural to be supernatural, where <laughs> uh, walking with Christ in the supernatural is normal. So uh, that's what I want. And the, the key to uh, getting past um, normal life and into that biblical style life is getting rid of unbelief. And unbelief is a tool, a true, a tool of the enemy, as is fear. That's why I started with the book War on Fear, because I'm more familiar, I know more about how that works. And so I started with War on Fear, and my next book most likely will be War on Unbelief. And so here's what, here's how it works. The enemy paints alternative truths, and they're not really truths. He paints lies. Let's just be frank about it. He paints lies and presents them as truth. And he does this on a regular enough basis that he maintains the fallacy and he will work very hard to maintain for us an alternate reality that is opposed and antithetical to the word of God. And our job is to maintain the truth, not only in our own lives, but to declare the truth, to declare what the scriptures teach so that we can lead others into truth. And <clears throat> I mean, don't, don't you recognize it? You, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about somebody and you want to pray for them. And the thought just there, maybe it's just a feeling. It's not, nothing's going to happen. You know, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> why embarrass yourself? Why, why go through all of that embarrassment and they're not going to get healed anyway? You know, just don't go. <laughs> a funny story. My mom... My mom was just so cool, and uh, she worked hard to create this wreath, and, and I mean, she really worked hard on it because she visualized it up on the side of her house, and um, she felt the Lord tell her to give it to her friend, uh, Thelma Lou, and she didn't want to give it to Thelma Lou. She, she didn't make it to give away. You know, this other girl, you know, she she didn't have as nice a stuff as mom, you know, and all this. And mom said, no, I'm not, you know, she just she just told herself that that, was, that wasn't God, you know. And, and uh, so, so what she did was she came up with an alternative plan. Well, I'll just find something nice in the house and give, and give it to her. And so she put something else in the house. And, 
and got in the car, and she was going to go take it to it to her and give it to her. And as she's back in the car out of the driveway, or about to, she hears in her spirit, it's a long way back to get the wreath. <laughs> and she, she knew it was the Lord, but she didn't want to admit it was the Lord. So she said out loud to nobody, to God, all right, I'll put it in the trunk, but I'm not giving it to her. <laughs> of course, you and I both know how the story ends. Of course, she wound up giving her the wreath. And as soon as she released this sense of entitlement to keep the wreath for herself, she then became excited to give it to Thelma Lou and to, and to release it to a friend. And it, it was a big blessing to her. And, you know, mom had no regret in the final analysis. So that was one instance. Another one was... Um, my dad won second place in a golf tournament. And, uh, and so his friend and he played in this golf tournament. His friend um, was a jewelry store owner, who, by the way, who I got my ring from. And, um, and there were raffle prizes, nice raffle prizes. And there was a golden statue. I don't know. It was a pear or something. <coughs> and, uh, and, they were had they had the raffle tickets, <laughs> and uh, and so mom bought a raffle ticket, you know, and 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 Jimmy's wife bought a raffle ticket, and they had raffle tickets, and um, I I I don't know if mom really looked at the numbers on her tickets or not, but my dad, her husband, said, "Here, let me hold your raffle tickets," and so he got the raffle tickets from mom, and then. He got the raffle tickets from Jimmy's wife, and he had them all in a big clump. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can see where this is going. So they, it was time to give away this beautiful pair that Mom had her eyes on. And uh, they read off the number on the raffle ticket. And, you know, Mom and, and Jimmy's w wife were both looking over, you know, and, and my dad said, hey, look, we got one. And Jimmy's wife immediately went, I won. I won. <laughs> and of course, mom's going, she owns a jewelry store. What does she need with a brass pair or whatever it was, silver, whatever, you know? And mom was just really torn up about it. She wanted that brass pair. Now you have to, you have to hear, you know, back when my mom was a, a little girl and growing up in Chicago, her parents didn't have two nickels to rub together. And at one point in my mom's life, she was the oldest of their three daughters. They actually took mom and put her in an orphanage just so that somebody could help feed her and, and, and take care of her. They'd have one less mouth to feed. And it was a vicious, cruel, bad place. And mom felt a lot of rejection because of it, as you can imagine, things like that will scar you for life. Um, you know, without going into all the things that happened to her, she always felt a sense of, I got to take in order to have. If I'm going to have anything, I got to have it. I got to grab it. I got to grab it. And uh, so that was in full play when this pair, whole, the whole pair situation. And then she heard the Lord speak to her and say, give her the pair. And Oh, man, mom struggled, but then she decided to, all right, and she released it. And then the next week, um, my dad did a deal, and they wound up getting 300 appliances. We have an appliance store in Orlando, new and used appliances, all used now, but at the time. And uh, they got this incredible deal, and mom was sure that uh, it was a reward for her relinquishing her right to that pair because she was sure it was actually her number. <laughs> hey, Lenny, good to see you. I appreciate you for being on. So anyway, what's the point? We all have a sense of entitlement. We all feel a sense of our own domain. And when the Lord comes along and says things like, Whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life 
for my sake, will save it unto eternal life. Well, we have one of those friends that sits on our pocket that tries to make us feel entitled. And he will tell you of your rights. He will tell you how cruel and unfair God is being by demanding that you lay down your life. How, how unfair is that? Are you mean really? Genuinely really? And, or, or you'll see something that appeals to your sense of, um, what is it when you want something? Uh, you're coveting, covetousness. You know, you, 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 you want that Tesla or something you, you can actually afford, you know, something, uh, the guitar or the software package or whatever. And, and you tell yourself you have a right to it. And so maybe you go outside your budget and you just go ahead and buy it. But we listen to this voice of the accuser and he gets us into so much trouble. And if we would simply exercise, the, do the hard work of uh, fighting to hang on to the truth of the Word of God, then we can be those faith-filled Book of Acts, New Testament, miracle every day kinds of people. And, uh, and I, uh, a friend of mine preached a sermon um, Sunday and share and and I called him to talk to him about these things and he said it's ironic that you've decided this week would be the week that you would talk about it because I preached on just that kind of thing on Sunday and he actually brought an old World War II sword that he had gotten from his dad uh, to the sermon to talk about weaponry weaponry because we are every every Christian is at war with the kingdom of darkness. Um, I wrote the book War on Fear because we need to be at war with fear. Why? Because fear is already at war with us. See, that's, that's what we must understand. The enemy is not living peacefully with us. If, if you're sensing no attack from the enemy, then you are already a prisoner of war. You, are, you have already laid down your weapons, and you are already living far below what God has for you. And so I challenge you to listen to this scripture, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. This is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. In other words, we're not, you know, with the AK-47 and, and the tanks and all that. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. We're fighting against very real enemies, and they're even more real because they can walk through walls and attack us when we are in the comfort of our own home. We use, this is uh, verse 2, verse 4, actually. It starts in 3. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. You know, the Word of God and the words of God found in the Word of God are actually powerful. They are uh, mighty, and they demolish strongholds. They are... um, they are powerful, and they are not meant to be left to the side. They are meant to be used whenever these thoughts come against us. <clears throat> we use God's mighty weapons. We use, not we look at, not we just shine and polish. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. What did the devil say to Eve in the garden? Did God really say? You know, there are people that say Adam and Eve aren't real, that they're, that they're just some idea. Well, then, then the whole idea of, of uh, Lucifer coming along and tempting her, 
isn't real either. You know, did God really say? And what is he doing there? He's accusing God of being unfair. He's accusing God of being um, unfaithful. He's accusing God of lying. And that's what he does to us. You know, how many times have you said in your mind when you read a certain scripture, well, it says it, but it doesn't mean it. It says it, but it, it doesn't mean it. I, I've, I've used that excuse many times uh, as a reason why I can just step over uh, one of God's laws of love and do a sin and commit a sin. We destroy, uh, let's see, verse 5. We destroy every proud ar- obstacle, every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. See, these thoughts are not benign. They are designed to defeat us. They Listen, our weapons demolish those strongholds, but they are trying to demolish us. And they are the aggressors, and we are being aggressive against a unseen and yet very powerful enemy. And that's, the, that's, that's what we're called to do. It's, it's a daily, not every moment, but whenever we f- sense. And that's what I, I told my friend when I called him. I said, you know, I want to pray for my sister, Janice. But when I get ready to pray for her, I sense this like mocking going on on the inside of me, like the devil just laughing at me, you know, and saying, your, 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 your prayers are not effective. Your prayers are never going to work. You have no power. Why, why are you bothering to go through the motions? And that, you know what? In the Bible, there have been many times when the enemies of God's people would mock them and mock our God and say he is powerless to defend you against us. And that's what I feel when uh, this sense uh, comes along and deadens my faith. It attempts to pour water, it attempts to pour water on my fervor, on my, my desire to step out in faith and, 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 and pray for somebody and see miracles happen. I've seen miracles happen. I've walked in that kind of faith. And so what my friend did was he shared this scripture with me and then shared the entire sermon that he preached on Sunday um, about destroying these philosophies and arguments. And that's what the, the enemy does. He argues against the truth of God's word by presenting alternative truths, which are not truths at all. They're lies. Every proud obstacle, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. Do you want to share your faith? Well, let me tell you, the devil does not want you to share your faith, and he will put an obstacle of unbelief or some other thing in your way to keep you. He, he, he does not want you to be effective. Everything you do for Christ will be rewarded in eternity. And every time you listen to one of these demons and obey our mortal enemy rather than the God who died for us, you're not going to be, you're not going to be rewarded for disobedience, okay? You're, you, had mom just blown past God's word to her, give Thelma Lou the wreath, and not done it, she, wouldn't, she would have seen no reward. But now she's in heaven, and she has most certainly had that moment pointed out to her and her choice to do the right thing. Even though she was tempted to do the wrong thing, she chose and acted on the right thing once she, once she got over her, the temptation, the stronghold that was pulling her to disobey God. And that's what they do. And so we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Hallelujah. And that's how it works, folks. We do battle. And the weapons of our warfare are not a sword and a spear, but they are the sword of the Spirit, right? 
They are the word of God. Very powerful. When the enemy came against Jesus as he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights, of everything, no bread, no water, how he physically lived through that is, is, is probably a miracle. I didn't know people could live without water for 40 days, but Jesus did it. And the enemy came to him and said, hey, Jesus, why don't you just, you know, turn these stones into bread? And he probably, prov- he probably did it right when uh, the Sunbeam Bread Factory was, was baking their fresh loaves so that the, the scent of fresh baked bread was wafting through the desert at that very moment. That's how the devil works. He'll, he'll pile up a, a half-truth with an untruth, and then and he'll throw in a temptation, a distraction, anything to get you off track. Because his, he's got an agenda, and that's for Jesus not to be seen through my life and through your life. That's what he wants, but we've got the answer. We've got the answer, folks. It's to yield to to Christ and obey the scriptures that say, wield those weapons, those mighty weapons. Tear down those strongholds. We do it the same way Jesus did. Thus saith the Lord. That's what he said to the enemy in the desert. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, even if it's an Arnold roll, even if it's, you know, Panera bread, fresh baked uh, pastries but by every word of God. You see, the word of God is more than just, it's, 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 not, it's not just a book. It's a sword. It's not just, you know, Susie Homemaker. It's a tank. And it'll tear down. It'll demolish those strongholds. And when those strongholds are out of the way, you can pass right through and do the will of God. You can pass right through and pray, and watch God move. And I'm just not going to be uh, daunted by the fact that Janice and others are not healed yet. I, I am continuing to believe God for miracles, and I'm not going to back down, and I am going to continue my war on fear, my war on unbelief, and continue to Watch God move in men's and women's hearts. And it's absolutely fun. It's a blast. It's so much, I receive so much joy from the sense in my heart of being obedient to God. And not, not, not only that, but the folks I get to talk to, hey, Patricia, good to see you, my friend. The, the folks that I get to talk to get a blessing. Because when you're talking in obedience to Christ, then Christ is inhabiting your words. I mean, a spiritual transaction is taking place. A miracle is taking place. You don't see him, but he's there. Just like this brick wall behind me. You don't, you don't, you don't necessarily see it, but you know that's a definite brick wall right behind me, right? Right? Because why? There's, there's, there's no reason to believe otherwise. I mean, there it is. You can see it with your own two eyes. And that's exactly what the devil does. That's right. There is no brick wall behind me. The devil lies. He is an illusionist. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except by him. And how it all works, I don't know. I know God is fair. I don't know how it'll all work out in the end. But I know God is just. I know he is loving. And I know he is fair. And I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So I want God to change me. I want God to fire me up. Stick me in the cannon and shoot me out to have an impact on the world. Turn up the fire in my life. 
Burn up the liar in me Do anything you need to use my life Turn up the fire I want to see in me a life free from all these struggles that hold me down Do anything you need to do in me so we can get this missionary off the ground Hey! the fire in my life burn up the liar in me do anything you need to use my life turn up the fire I want to take your message to the world there are so many millions that are living a lie if you come back and I haven't done nothing I don't want to face you I would rather die Chastisement, it isn't any fun. But to prove that you love me, you're my father, I'm your son. You want to make me like you, what better thing could you do? I want to be like you. Turn up the fire in my life, burn up the liar in me. Do anything you need to use my life. Turn up the fire. Turn up the fire in my life Burn up the liar in me Crank up the torch and burn the chaff away Turn up the fire Burn up the liar, I said Turn up the fire In me! <laughs> yeah! Do it, Lord. Use me. Use us all. Help us to be light and peace and truth and love, to lay down our lives for one another and see the gospel go forward. Yes, and we are all in, my friends, right? Oh, Lord, yes, have your way with us. Lord, we, we yield our lives to you. We ask you, God, to take us, use us, mold us, make us anything you want us to be, and, and release us to a lost and dying world. We want to please you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today. What a joy. That uh, scripture verse, by the way, I'd encourage you to read it. Check it out in different versions. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Verses 3 through 6, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. And uh, have an excellent afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow on The John Morgan Show. God bless you. Well, I'm the free world leader. Freedom's rolling out to you. Oh, thank you so much for tuning into the John Morgan Show. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve you. God bless you. If you enjoyed the content from today's show, please hit that like button. And if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. And please do me a favor and share this out with your friends. I appreciate you so much. Keep promise keepers in your prayer. It starts tomorrow in Dallas, Texas. It's going to be fantastic. One of my very favorite speakers, Robert Morris, is speaking. I think he's headlining the thing. Should be incredible. No, it's not incredible. I don't like the word incredible. Amazing. There you go. Seems how lately, babe, 
I got a bad case of red, white, and blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, everybody.